from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 38, recorded on April 30, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. And today we'll look at Paul's latest column called An Underutilized Lifesaver. So let's start, Paul, by telling everyone what is Paxlovid. Right. So Paxlovid is an antiviral medication. It's a protease inhibitor. Um, and it works to progress, to, to prevent the progression to severe disease if taken early in the disease process. So early meaning how many days after you have, have a positive test, like five days or something like that? Well, preferably within the first three days. Uh, yeah. The earlier, the better. It, you know, as we've talked about and Dr. Griffin has talked about, there's two phases to illness. There's the first phase where viral replication is the most important component. And then your immune system kicks in, which is when you develop symptoms. And when that happens, um, the um, viral replication becomes a less important part of the disease process. So the earlier you treat, the better you are likely, the more you are likely to decrease viral replication and have an effect. Now, in your column, you write extensively about how much Paxlovid has been tested. Why don't you give us a, a, a feeling for that? Right. So, so, so starting early, um, the first publication I remember in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine was like in 2022. Um, but at that point, there had uh, the, the testing that was done was done in people who, who hadn't been vaccinated. But what, when that paper was published, mo- many people had been vaccinated. So the paper was criticized in that regard. And what that paper showed was that if you took Paxlovid early, you had a dramatic decrease in the incidence of hospitalization, the highest is sort of in the 70 to 80 percent range. And then studies were done looking at people who were vaccinated or naturally infected or both. And they consistently showed that you had at least a 50 percent reduction in hospitalization and and an even greater percentage of reduction in death, as much as 70 percent or more in death. But again, you had to take it early. I mean, as we progressed in this pandemic and most people, virtually all people had either been vaccinated or naturally infected or both, um, it became harder to show that there was a, a, a difference in terms of progression to hospitalization because people had a lot of underlying immunity. But even in this most recent study, the one that came out in April 2024, um, there was clear evidence that there was a decrease in hospitalization. What patient population should be taking Paxlovid? Right. People who are at highest risk of developing severe disease, because that's the goal of this antiviral, to keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the intensive care unit, keep you out of the morgue. So who's at highest risk? Um, People who have who are elderly. um, And if you look at at the definition, at least as defined by U.S. studies or U.K. studies, that's the 75 greater than 75 year old or greater than 80 year old. People who have high risk medical conditions like like obesity, diabetes, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, people who are pregnant and people who are immune compromised. Those four groups, if you're in one of those groups and you have respiratory symptoms, you should test yourself to see whether or not you have COVID. And if you have COVID, you should treat yourself with an antiviral. Are there any people who cannot take Paxlovid? Right. So, so Paxlovid has many, many drug interactions for allergy drugs, antibiotics, uh, neuropsychiatric drugs, um, uh, lipid lowering agents. There are a whole cadre of dozens and dozens of drugs that interfere with the effect of Paxlovid. So um, I think the doctor then has to make a decision, which is the greater risk. If I stop these other drugs, for say three days or five days, is that the greater risk, or is the greater risk, um, um, you know, not treating with Paxlovid, and 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 that's the calculation. I think what tends to be to happen is sometimes you know, a physician will say, well, you know, there's these drug drug interactions. I don't want to give you Paxlovid, and thus puts the patient at even greater risk. As you've probably heard on Daniel Griffin's programs. Uh, many doctors, when confronted with an elderly patient who tests positive, often say, let's wait and see. Why is that, before prescribing Paxlovid, that is, why is that a bad idea? (laughs) It's the worst possible advice because, because, again, you want to try and give an antiviral 
when viral replication is greatest. As you move along two days, three days, four days, five days into illness, and the, the immune response kicks in, B cells make antibodies, T cells uh, make uh, kill virus, uh, virus infected cells, you get it, the viral replication becomes less and less, and therefore the drug will become less and less effective. The earlier, the better. Frankly, the minute you know that you are, are COVID positive and you're in a high risk group, take Paxlovid if you can. So- but again, you should work with your doctor. I mean, I think. That, that, you know, your, your doctor knows your medical story the best. Your doctor knows whether or not you can safely stop Paxlovid. And there are other drugs as well. There's remdesivir, there's molnupiravir. So there are other drugs which have a le- much lesser sort of drug-drug interactions that may be better for you. So if a patient has had uh, COVID for some days and is beginning to have difficulty breathing and needs to be admitted to hospital, is that too late for Paxlovid? Well, so, so when the original studies were done, actually, back in 2000, um, 20, in 2020, when this virus was in this country and raging, the, the first studies, interestingly, which were done with remdesivir that were, were uh, reported in October of 2020, were in hospitalized patients. And, and uh, there was some effect still, even at that point. The same thing you could argue with conv- convalescent serum, which is essentially SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies, those studies were also done in hospitalized patients. And you would, again, would have preferred that they were done much earlier, but still showed showed some efficacy. So I do think there is some efficacy um, even later, especially, you know, we're, we're, we're different. You know, one, we're an outbred population. Two, we have different capacities to respond. And for some people, the viral replication stage may last longer than in other people. So I do think there is some value. But there's no value in saying... Let's wait and see. No, that's bad. That's a bad <laughs> idea. Another th- topic you cover in your article is the, the the phrase that gets Daniel very upset: Paxlovid rebound. Tell us about that. Right. So that's not a thing. Sort of like the Eagles' defense last year was not a thing. Um, <laughs> this is not a thing, and and it, it's understandable how people could think that. So so um, when you take Paxlovid, preferably early in illness, um, you take it for five days. And then now you're moving into the symptomatic phase of illness, the second phase. So you stop the Paxlovid and then your symptoms worsen. So, so the reasoning at the time was, so what's happened? Maybe what's happened is that as we stop the Paxlovid, there's been an increase in viral replication, which has caused an increase in symptoms. That wasn't true. And the way that you, you do that study is you look at people who took Paxlovid for that five days or didn't take Paxlovid and then see whether or not there is a difference in that, that level of symptoms then after that five-day period is over. And there wasn't. So the better term would have been COVID rebound. You're entering your second stage of illness where symptoms are greater. Um, I think it, it was and helped in some ways um, when Dr. Uh, Fauci took Paxlovid and then had a worsening of symptoms and took a second course of Paxlovid. That sort of sent the message that Paxlovid rebound might have been a thing, a- a- although in his defense, you know, you learn as you go. I-, I think that has always been true with this this pandemic. We learn as we go, and now we know that, that Paxlovid rebound is not a thing. Still, many physicians will tell patients, I'm not giving you Paxlovid because of rebound. So how can we educate these physicians. Right. Well, well that, so that's our job. I mean, our job is to try and make sure that we can get that information out there in a compelling and passionate and compassionate way so people can understand this. And by explaining, I think, the, the pathogenesis behind all of this, I think it, it's that to me has always been um, the most important thing, I guess, in my infectious disease training. It was a book by Cedric Mims called The Pathogenesis of Infectious Diseases. That book was the best book I ever read for what I do, because it, it wasn't just sort of a bug drug book. It was a here's how it works. Here's how the virus, in this case, is trying to gain access to the host. Here's how the host fights back. And that's what you need to understand. It, it has to make sense. What the, Your recommendations have to make sense based on the pathogenesis of the infection. I think we just need to explain it better clearer, more compellingly. So in the U.S., there's still hundreds of deaths a week from COVID. Can many of those be prevented by treatment with Paxlovid? I, I, from, from the most recent data, you could argue as many as half of those deaths can be prevented. I think this is, is a, as the title of the article suggests, an underused lifesaver. I, I just think we're a little cavalier about this, in some ways because 
We clearly have a highly immune population at this point. Most people have been vaccinated or naturally infected or both. Clearly, hospitalization rates are declining, deaths are declining. But, but in part, remember, this is we're now at the end of April, moving to the beginning of May. So we're moving into later spring. Uh, the, the, in all likelihood, this will settle out to be a winter disease. This is true for the four strains of human coronavirus that circulate, or flu, or paraflu, or human metanuovirus, or basically winter viruses. This may well also be a winter virus. So we shouldn't be lulled into this sort of false notion that now that things are going down, um, in terms of hospitalizations and death with COVID that were good. Um, I imagine we will see this again uh, roaring back uh, next winter. And, and we should make sure that we're thoughtful about the use of antivirals early on, because um, I think no one ever think it's, thinks it's going to happen to them. That, that's the problem. You know, initially you start off, your, your illness is relatively mild, congestion, cough, runny nose, sore throat, joint ache, muscle ache, fever. You're thinking, you know, I'm going to get better. And then you don't get better. And then you're taking it when it's a little later in the illness, when the Paxlovid will work much less well, uh, because we never imagined that bad things will happen. And if you look at, at when people were dying of, of this, this virus, and you know, in, after we had a vaccine, 2021, 2022, when interviews that were done by, by hospitalists and intensive care folks, I think that was basically the theme. I never thought this would happen to mm. me until it happens to you. So Paxlovid is not, unfortunately, available in many countries, it is available here in the U.S., but many of our writers, listeners say they can't get it. So I don't know if you have an answer, but what can be done about that? It's kind of unfair, isn't it? No, it's incredibly unfair. I mean, we're, we're a uh, technologically advanced, wealthy country. I think um, it's, it, it's our job as well as the job of other technologically advanced, wealthy countries to, to make this product and to make it available for free at, at these these in these countries, we can do that. The, you know, the companies certainly make enough money off Paxlovid. It has been a windfall for these companies, as was the vaccine a windfall. And I just think um, the the goal shouldn't always be to maximize the bottom line. I think we need to act in a virtuous manner and and do what we can to help the world. I, you know, I think Dr. Griffin always says it best: no one is safe uh, until everyone is safe. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise at, on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 